buying a home or selling a home is an emotional process. I think when I'm first meeting someone, a potential buyer, um, I take the doctor approach. All right. If you're thinking about investing in real estate in 2024, you're going to want to listen to this. So today I've got the great Andy Hunt here with me. He is with the Nashville on the move team with Keller Williams. And he is in really out of 19,000 realtors in the Nashville area. He is in the top 1%. And Andy serves some great markets in and around Nashville that we're going to talk about today. And for those of you that are investors or you're thinking about purchasing something like a second home, Andy works and lives part-time on 30A in the Panhandle on um, in Florida. And so also he works a lot in the in the in the Eastern Tennessee market, Gatlinburg area, Pigeon Forge, all that. And so then, you know, you've got short-term rentals in Nashville. Nashville is blowing up like never before. It is the place to be. So Andy has been a realtor for some time, and we're going to talk about how he got started today. So Andy, thanks for coming on, brother. Yeah, thanks yeah, for having good me. To see you. Good to see you. So tell us how you got started, um, you know, for those out there that may not know, because you weren't always a realtor, right? I was were, not. Yeah. You were in the entertainment business, right? I was. Um, I can talk about music or I can talk about, uh, I owned a CrossFit gym for a hot minute as well yeah. in East Nashville. I remember um, that. Yep. And, um, but no, I, I moved to town like most to do, to do music and enjoyed a healthy music career for gosh, from 2004 to really 2019 was when I kind of stopped saying, Yes to uh, gigs. gigs. Yeah. Uh, I was a music producer, mixer, engineer uh, around town and met some really cool people. And um, yeah, I did a lot of fun stuff. And then I uh, fell in love with CrossFit and bought into a CrossFit gym in East Nashville and then really said, said no to music in 2019 and said um, no to the CrossFit gym, sold it in 2019. And uh, just focused on real estate, which I was in. So I, I heard a, I heard a podcast once where the guy was like, "Hey, you can you can really do three things well. You can, and then that fourth thing is going to throw a monkey wrench." And I was like, "Great, I've got the the CrossFit gym, I've got real estate, and I've got music." And then he was like, "And don't forget about family and community." And <laughs> hey, I was like, "Got oh, got it." So I am I've got monkey wrenches. So um, I just decided to focus on real estate. And uh, I've been doing it now for uh, a little over seven years and, uh, and really enjoy it. I, it's one thing that's always interests me because in college I used to build houses. Uh, I co-founded the Ole Miss chapter of Habitat yeah. for Humanity. Um, I, I really just liked the idea of building things out of wood. I liked the framing of it and the trim work of it. Um, and the finishes, I would always laugh about wanting to go to Bed Bath & Beyond to look at kitchen mm -hmm. stuff or mm -hmm. go to Home Depot to look at kitchen stuff. Um, and so just kind of had fun with the houses. So it was a natural move for me because it's still very client-based and, and, and ho hospitality-based yeah. where you're taking care of clients' needs, individual clients, what do they need? Um, and so I really fell in love with it and just decided to do it full-time. Yeah. It's gone well for you. So how did you plug in with the group which you're with? I mean, Alan Perry, been around a long time, stalwart in this industry. So how did you how'd you plug in there? Yeah. So shout out to Alan. He is the team leader for Nashville on the Move, uh, a mentor of mine and a friend of mine. Um, when I joined the team in 2016, um, he and I had been friends since 2005. Oh, wow. Um, so... Uh, I just, I was like, Hey man, want to go to coffee one day? And he was like, yeah, is there anything I can prepare for? I was like, I don't <laughs> think so. Just come and have coffee with me. <laughs> and so I was like, Hey, I think I might be interested in doing real estate. Here are my reasons why. Um, and he was like, dude, I think you would do great at real estate. I'm looking to grow my team and you'd be a perfect fit. Um, and so I've been with his, his team ever since. Um, I do a lot of the training for the new agents on the team. Nice. Um, it's just a really good cast of characters, um, from our, uh, transaction manager whom, you know, as well, mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Andy Hubbard, mm -hmm. Hubs. uh, Hubs, um, I've known Hubbard. I got him the job with Nashville on the move, uh, known him for years too. He's a fantastic drummer and a, and a good human as well. So, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then better, Suzanne Fletcher, a person. he's yeah. a better person. And Suzanne Fletcher is our director of marketing, uh, director of operations now. Um, but so between the admin and, and Alan and the rest of the team, it's just a really solid team to be a part of. So super tight. I mean, and a lot of that has to do with, with, uh, no joke, Andy, I mean, Hubbard, you got, you got three Andys there. You got you and Andy Bill and Andy, a Andy Hunt. So, um, uh, sorry, Andy Hubbard, a Andy Hubbard. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, everything just seems to run just super tight, super smoothly. And that's just a testament to you guys' team and Alan's leadership. So when when we were looking for a new transaction manager, um, Hubbard approached me about the opportunity. And I just knew he'd be a good fit. And and years ago, years and years and years ago, um, I helped him move. This is before he got married. Um, I helped him move and I remember moving his, his dresser and he, all his socks and clothes and everything were folded <laughs> so perfectly, oh, yeah. like just uh -huh. color coordinated and folded perfectly. And he was so meticulous and there, anytime. So we used to work together in the studio as well. Whenever I produced a record or mixed a record, Hubbard was, uh, on the drums, a solid drummer. And he was so meticulous about getting things right and accurate then. And I was like, man, you'd be a great fit. And he has been like, he's, yeah. he's very much like a type one, uh, ones and zeros, you know, but yet customer focus wants to make sure the customer is happy and just does a great job with management. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, it's sometimes in that position, it can be robotic. I mm -hmm. think so many tr transaction coordinators, or I'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. exactly his, what he goes by. It seems like so much more than that, but you're juggling, you're juggling, juggling a lot of balls and a lot of moving parts. Um, but then he just brings this whole, you know, his whole incredible personality to it as well. And I, I think that's not always the case. I mean, you know, it's not that it's bad. I guess you see these experiences other. It's just like, it's just kind of more of a, a transactional kind of thing, I suppose. And with him, I think it's just, it's really cool, especially just on the lending side when we work with him, you know, it's not just, you know, the people, uh, the, the buyers and sellers, but it's just even on our side, it's, it's really mm -hmm. good. You know, he works with our team and working with y'all's, but so talk about what you see coming on, you know, here we're approaching 2024, a very unique year. Um, I think the first part of the year was kind of, uh, different than the last part of the year, would you say? I mean, it was, seems like it was, you know, there was more contraction, people more frozen sitting on the sidelines, the second part of the year, maybe in the last quarter and a half, you know what I mean? Um, There's been a little bit more activity for sure. It's funny that you asked that because I was just l looking through some old Instagram videos and I found one from a, a long time ago, like with this still within the last year, but it just said like kind of the same thing as now is like, it's still a good time for buyers. Mm -hmm. Like buyers still have a lot of good um, room to negotiate. And my concern, yes, the rates are starting to come down a little bit. Rates have sidelined a lot of folks uh, and, and stalled the market in a lot of ways. But the, the reality is like, if I saw, I saw an, another article that was talking about Nashville, I think is, I think you said number seven, number three, I don't remember which, but it was like pent up demand. Yeah. And the, that's the truth. If, if rates come down more, which some say they will, there's consumer confidence out there. So that's why rates are moving, which is great. Then we're, we may see more, we may see more bidding wars again. We may see more, Hey, I'll take it with a, as is contingency mm -hmm. or I'll waive this or I'll pay over appraisal. And, and I, and I don't think that that's good for the market either. Yeah. Why is that? Well, just because that'll start to drive the prices back up again. Yeah. And then, you know, I had a lot of good qualified first time home buyers who had saved up 20% looking for a house and they just got beat with either cash buyers or I'll waive the appraisal or I'll waive, I'll pay 20 K over appraisal. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we're going back to that, but you know, there is pent up demand. And if the, if the rates do continue to come down, um, you know, I just, I hope that we don't see that kind of market. I think the good news is real estate got back to real estate. Mm -hmm. It got back to, you know, this is a good location. This is a good home. And uh, I will, I would like to make an offer on it right. versus like, Hey, this home is kind of needs to have some work to it. It's not in that great of an area. And you're a little bit overpriced. 
Right. So I, I think that there's a lot of hair on that sort of situation, right? Yeah. I think that now real estate's gotten back to, you know, is this house going to move? What can we do? So as a listing agent, it's always having that conversation of like, Hey, these are the things that we need to do to make sure your home stands out above the others. Here's your competition. Here's right. the days on market. Here's the feedback those agents are receiving. Cause I always talk to the other listing agents to mm -hmm. see, Hey, what's going on with your houses. Uh, what's the feedback been for your homes? And then I can present that to any potential a client or seller that I'm working with and saying like, right. hey, these are the things we need to do. There's a there's a house um, that I'm thinking of right now that they did really cool eccentric uh, um, paint jobs on the in the bedrooms. And I'm like, those need to be those need to be repainted. Oh, yeah. You know, there's the it's no longer a home when you decide to sell it. It's a product. Mm -hmm. It's a house. Mm -hmm. And so just, um, that's the kind of market we're in where it's like, let's put our best foot forward and get creative to move something. So what do you anticipate this first quarter? Do you, do you well, I, I think the market is, it's still very seasonal. Um, so even if rates maintain where they are, I think we'll see a lot more activity in the new year. I think we'll see our, our spring activity. Um, so I think that, you know, Nash, Nashville, especially, um, is going to still follow that seasonal cycle. You know, it, we actually had a little bit of a bump here at the end of the year, which we don't always see mm -hmm. November, December, you know, it's usually pretty quiet. Um, but I had, um, a listing of mine go under contract that I told the seller, Hey, it may not sell until 2024. Yeah. You know, it's usually crickets right now. Um, but we still did everything that we could to push it and to market it and make sure people enjoyed it. And we did, we got it under contract and, Congratulations. uh, which is great. Yeah. Thank you. But that's, I think that's also has to do with, you know, yes, we, we did what we needed to do on our end, but also with the fed coming out and saying, Hey, you know, we're, we're not going to raise rates. We're mm -hmm. actually may end up lowering them. Um, there's just more consumer confidence in the marketplace, which brought rates down, as you know. And, um, I think that's why we've, we've seen some more activity and I think it'll continue in 2024. Yeah. I think the same thing. Um, and it is, it's so interesting as you talk about, you know, the first time buyers, cause that's who I, the empathy is for It's the people that, you know, they're prepared, they're ready. And then it, <clears throat> what I hear a lot of times is they they keep moving the goalposts or I'll hear that or something, something along those lines. And it, what about, you know, you're talking about competition, institutional buyers. I mean, a lot of people are concerned about that sort of thing. I mean, what, what do you see? I mean, I think the percentages are much lower than what people think. I mean, there, I think there's some almost false narratives out there about, you know, the, 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 the how high the percentages of institutional buyers with the Black Rock. The Black Rock and yeah, Vanguard and Vanguard, State Street and all those. Yes. But it, it, when you really start to, to research it, it doesn't seem like there's any, but did you have some personal experience with that? Did you have this year? Did you encounter that? Because I do feel like that people in America, we just, you know, we, we get an, sort of caught up in the media and whatever, you know, the story is. And sometimes that was a storyline for a while there. You know, it's kind of died down a little bit, but um, it would be interesting to see as we go. But what about you? Did you see anything like that this year? Did you have clients get beat out? I, by, I, I definitely had clients get beat out by – and you, sometimes you don't know as the sure. buyer's agent, right? They'll say like, you know, Hey, your offer was great, but it was all, you know, the, and I'll be like, well, tell me, was it all cash? Can you give me any kind of hints? Can you give me kind of any, you know, insight onto what's actually going on? And they would mention, you know, maybe that it was all cash. And so right. maybe that was the, yeah. that the could have been, and yeah, the indicator that Especially it was. Especially if it's like a $350,000, $400,000 right. home or something, you know, starter entry level. But then sometimes I wonder how many times people are making offers on houses and buying them and you don't really know where that, that product is going to end mm -hmm. up. Like it could have been a, a buyer that buys for State Street or buys mm -hmm. for Vanguard or buys for BlackRock. Right. And then eventually ends up in their portfolio. Right. Um, I have had sellers um, or listing agents ask me uh, when we had a buyer, you know, hey, is this an investor? They don't really want to sell to investor. They mm -hmm. want to sell to... Um, a family or they want to sell right. to, you know, a first time home buyer. Like there were some sellers that were like, we don't want to sell to, right. a, to an investor. It's good when people do that. I just think, you know, it's a, they're utilizing the only power that they have really in a sense. I mean, um, as to who they're going to sell to, 
it just makes it difficult, you know, when they come in overbidding. But I really do think that as rates come down, you know, what it's this seesaw effect. And, you know, historically in lending, what we see is, you know, rates go down, prices go up. And so, um, and it's just because the sellers can be a little more choosy, you know, they can be a little bit more, um, you know, they don't have to provide as much, you know, conce- many concessions, you know, that sort of thing. So they can be a little more choosy. And I think that's where it, that, I think that's the story that uh, is hard to sort of convey. Do you agree? Like to, I think some people just think there's still just a contingency of people out there that just think it's going to crash. You know, the market's just, it's just overinflated. And as much as I was in shock, and I'm sure you were in shock. Like, I just remember that quarter, right? You know, that first quarter of the year, a couple of years ago, when it seemed like everyone's property just went up about 25% over the course of a quarter. It's like, well, you know, and the thing was, is there was just so many people moving here from other places, from California, and it's much more reasonable. But the people that are already here, you know, they're thinking they got left behind. And so, hey, this can't sustain. This house was 300000 You're telling me it's 500000 now or whatever. And, you know, it's kind of like it's whatever the market will sustain. And then I think for those who, you know, in, were around or heard about 2008, they're just thinking like, okay, well, it can crash. But it's just a different story now. I mean, this, there's just, yeah. it's not the same reasons. No, there, there's not. And and there is that sentiment of there, there's a possibility the market would crash. I don't see any markers for that either. I think that there's still too much demand and not enough supply. Right. Um, I think that there are some folks that um, are probably waiting until rates come down. And when they do, I think that's just going to inject it with more demand, which mm-hmm. to your point will raise prices. I think that though, when the rates come down, my question would be at what point do the sellers truly have more of the power back? Mm-hmm. Because I think that they don't have that much power right now. Um, and I think that it's going to still be for a while location, 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 and is your house in good condition? Because like there's still a demand, but it's a demand for the right house. Mm-hmm. I was talking to a builder friend of mine this morning where he's like not doing as many spec homes uh, because it's the buyers are starting to have more power and they're becoming more picky yeah. on what it is they actually want to buy. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I hear a little bit of both. I mean, I heard um, on a call today where some builders are – are pulling their concessions that they're giving. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you kind of hear both ways. To me, that would indicate that they don't need to give the concessions. I don't know the reason why else you would do that, but, um, you know, that they're getting enough demand. But I think the thing about it is if you look historically, it's this this idea or this fact that m- more millennials are aging up to the age 33 than in the history of America. Mm-hmm. And so that, what is the significance of age 33? Well, it's, that's when millennial, that's when people typically start buying their home. So you can apply that and see that you have all this pent up demand that's sitting on the sidelines and perhaps even more so in a city like Nashville, that's, you know, high demand. It's always in the top 10 places. It's affordable, um, you know, with the infrastructure that we have, with jobs, all the industry that we have with healthcare and, because people just think it's just about music, but I mean, people are coming here for this, you know, for all sorts of reasons, you know, and the affordability is one of those. And I think it's just, it's interesting to see how this is all going to play out, you know? Yeah. Music's third. So yeah. healthcare is first and tourism second. Mm-hmm. And then music is third. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a stressful thing to buy a house, right? I mean, how do you navigate, help navigate that with people, you know, because it's, you're almost, I don't want to say like a counselor or therapist, but I mean, there's definitely, you know, especially the more competition, man, just the more, you know, people get emotional, you know, and you've got to help navigate that with them, right? Well, it it is emotional. Buying a home or selling a home is an emotional process. I think when I'm first meeting someone, a potential buyer, um, I take the doctor approach. And the idea behind that is, Whenever I go into the doctor's office, th- he has a chart where he's got all my information. He knows all the facts. He knows why I'm there. It's not a secret. And he still asks me, hey, man, what's going on today? 
tell me, tell me what's going on. Right. And then he, he, that kind of tears down some walls of like, you know, not going through the chart and, Hey, I see that you've got these conditions and, you know, it's just like, Hey man, what's going on? And so talking to a potential buyer, when I find out they're looking to buy, it's like, well, just tell me more about that. Like, what are y'all looking for? Mm -hmm. What's the reason why? What's the goal? Um, so just trying to ask them the right questions to, um, help uh, navigate them. Mm -hmm. I, I like to say I'm more of a real estate advisor. Like I want to, um, similar to, similar to music theory, like the guys, there's so many music, musician friends of mine who know all the theory, like yeah. they're so smart, but then they just, um, they listen to the song and what does the song need? I'll play this one note. If that's all mm. the song needs, I'm talented enough to where I could play all the notes all the time but that's not what the song needs. So right. my goal is to be educated and know what's going on in the market, know mm -hmm. what's going on around me, know uh, vendors, know people I can connect them to just, but listen to their needs. And if all they need is this one thing, then that's all I can, that's what, that's what I offer them. Right. So my hope is to listen uh, and ask questions to help them feel more comfortable in the process. Yeah. Can you think of a time where you sort of, uh, you know, help the client through a really tough time where, you know, you're selling a house or helping them purchase a home. And it was just kind of a, kind of a tough time or any kind of like a struggle for them. You kind of helped navigate that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I've got a, a friend of mine, client who is, they're getting a divorce mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what should we do is, right. is the question. And again, it just goes back to, well, one, I'm really sorry to hear that. And, um, I'm here to help and listen and grab lunch and, and, and be a friend, but I want to be, um, an advisor through this process. I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to give you like legal advice, but let's just talk about, Hey, this is when you bought, here's the equity you've gained. What is the goal for each of you? Um, what is the best strategy? What do you mm -hmm. want? And he, he told me what he, what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And this is, these are things I would like. It's like, okay, let's see if, how we can navigate to achieve that. You know, I don't think you should sell if you don't have to right. keep what you have and can you work something else out? So just trying to walk with, um, a client when they're in a, in a hard place. I've done that a couple of times and, um, you know, again, just trying to listen to what they need and try to help them out. That's great. So let's talk about what's on your hat. 30A, for those of the, that don't know, 30A is it's County Highway 30A in the Gulf. So um, in between Panama City and Destin. So you have a home there. I have a home there. But I live closer to you in 30A. Than <laughs> that's I, right. Than that's I live right. to you in Yeah, I may be able to yell. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, could definitely fly my remote control plane if I had one over there. That's but, right. Um, but how, like, it's a really cool sort of this, it's almost like this pipeline of, uh, from Nashville. So especially the people that don't know, I mean, I was telling you about a friend of mine, um, Brian Yormack, who moved from Denver and just had no idea that this existed. And so and he had a brother that lived in Miami. His brother wasn't familiar. So, you know, Miami's just sort of disconnected from this you know, Hamptons on the beach kind of thing that they call it sometimes, uh, among other things. But it's not just about those high-end beach properties, but there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of people go down for spring break, a lot of people. So it's kind of the, one of the top destinations, right, for vacationers. And that's why I think it's become a good place for somebody like yourself to sort of plug people in down there, right? Well, it's, it's a pretty cool space because the, the the water is so beautiful, so clear, so transparent. The beaches are sugary white sand. And then along 30A, which is a short strip, is uh, there are several different towns. Yeah. And each town has a different vibe. I mean, you literally have everything over by like Shunk Gullies um, where it's it just feels like a flip-flop vibe or Grayton, Grayton Beach where you can park a truck mm -hmm. on the beach um, all the way down to, well, there, then there's Seacrest, yeah. um, Seaside, uh, all the way down to uh, Rosemary at the end where it's super fancy cobblestone, you know, mm -hmm. roads yeah. and high-end boutiques and yeah. high-end restaurants. So, I mean, there's, there's really kind of something for everyone, whatever kind of vibe you're feeling yeah. in your vacation space. And then like most vacation rentals, whenever you're um, looking to buy a short-term rental, it's always asking yourself, why would people come here? Right. And how easy is it for people to get here? 
And so 30A is a, is a short um, trip from everywhere from Dallas and Houston and um, Atlanta. Atlanta, Tennessee. You know, um, I went to Ole Miss for undergrad, and that's where I first learned about 30A. Um, a lot of folks went down there from, from Mississippi as well. So it's just easy to get to. Uh, now that there's a uh, direct flight southwest yeah. from, uh, from Nashville to Panama it's City very, very Beach. very, convenient. Inexpensive. Um, inexpensive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they do specials all the time. I mean, we booked a trip and uh, I'm going to go down in, in January and down in February just for a week by myself and just, you know, work on my business down there. But like the Southwest flight was like 50 bucks or something. Yeah, right, <laughs> it was right, just right, like right, right. a no brainer to go down there. And it's a guys, it's a really interesting thing that um, when you buy a short term rental, um, there's things like bonus depreciation that you can take advantage of and actually literally offset income. Uh, I'm not a CPA. You want to check with your CPA on that. But uh, this is how, you know, Andy and I and other people, investors that we've utilized um, the tax code to be able to get really significant tax deductions to be able to offset um, your earned income. And by simply buying, uh, you know, an investment property, second home, and then helping to manage that, logging your hours and how you do that. And uh, there's a lot of benefits to it. And I think especially for self-employed people as they start to write these checks and they see how much they're writing, you know, or if they're W-2 and they see how much they're getting taken out, uh, it, people start to look for different ways to to mitigate that and bring their tax basis down. And buying property, buying short-term rental is one of the ways to do that. Long-term rentals, you just don't get the the tax advantages that you do with the short-term rentals or commercial buildings would be another one. But it's very, very important conversation to have. So if you have those kinds of things, those questions, reach out to Andy or myself. But it's a great conversation to have. Like, how does this work? We can plug you in with a, you know, a, a tax specialist that can walk through what the scenario would look like for you. And, you know, we're talking about situations where someone has an income of $250,000, maybe they buy a million, million and a half dollar house, you know, and down on the Gulf, you're renting it out, having someone pay the payments, but maybe the tax deduction is offsetting a significant, significant portion of your earned income. And so when you start to do to talk about that, it's pretty, pretty impactful, right? Well, I think there's a lot of um, misconceptions, especially when, you know, when I say I own a beach, place. Mm-hmm. If I, even in my own head, I'm like, wait, did I just say that out loud? Like I've got, I've got a place at the beach and we have to, once, once you get in and realize, okay, the people that are staying there are covering my note. So it's not like I'm out of pocket because I, I do mine as a short-term rental and then my family and I have vacation there in the off mm-hmm. season. Um, and so just knowing that, okay, the actual note is covered by people that are staying there. Yeah. And um, finding a good cleaning crew down there, a good property management company down there, and you, you can go to visit your asset whenever you're, uh, you know, have the time. But then, yeah, the, with the the tax code is written, like 95% of the tax code was written to reduce your tax liability. Mm-hmm. You know, 5% of it wasn't. So it's like, what are the things that I need to do to reduce my tax liability? And owning real estate is one of those things. And owning a vacation rental is a, is a I, always like, I always like to say, I can't dip my toes into a 401k, Uh, you know? So it's even if, even if your place isn't a hundred percent cash flowing, because with, with the way that the market has gone, you know, you you may not, if you buy something new right now, you you may not cash flow a hundred percent, but you have to ask yourself, okay, am I, if I'm, if I'm investing in a retirement account, a 401k IRA of some kind, and if I'm investing that account, I'm putting money into that account every month. And if I'm ever going to go on vacation, like to 30A, obviously I'm buying there because we like to go on vacation Mm -hmm. there, then I'm essentially paying into my future vacation Mm -hmm. and my IRA at the same time. And I get to go enjoy it and it's growing in equity and there's tax benefits. And someone's paying it down. And someone's paying it down for me. Mm -hmm. So um, to where eventually if I've, you know, paid down a whole bunch, I, I refinance, I recast or whatever I need to do, and my, 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 my monthly payment might change, then all of a sudden I am cash flowing at that right, point. Right, right. Oh, it's an important factor because I think a lot of times people think the cash flow is the number one thing. It's really, it's the tax advantage that ends up being the number one factor or the biggest uh, factor 
when you're buying these properties with the other three, you know, coming in second, you know, the, the cash flow or, you know, the, the loan pay down. And then of course, appreciation over time of the asset. And, um, you know, that's an area that just doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. I mean, they're developing, uh, and some people would say overdeveloping, um, you know, but it's an amazing place. If you ever, if you guys ever saw the movie, the Truman show, that's actually filmed. That was a Jim Carrey movie. And that was actually filmed in the seaside town, which is amazing. Little, like one of the coolest little towns where my wife and I sort of in a way sort of met and, um, the, the little amphitheater there and Bud and Alley's, you know, and go, it's one of the best places I think to sort of see, you know, uh, the whole ocean to see the, watch the sun come down have a little cocktail or something like that. Right. I mean, totally true. Bud and Alley's been there since 1986, hard to believe, mm. but yeah. I think one of the other things that's great, great about a short term rental or vacation property that you own is I've noticed when I am down there with my family, if it rains, and I don't really, you know, usually you go on vacation, you're like, all right, we've got a week, we've saved up, yeah, you yeah. know, like we're going to have fun on this trip. Yeah. But when you own the place, if it rains, you're like, man, it rained, yeah. you know, okay, right. we'll hang out for a bit because we'll, we'll be back. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it feels less stressful yeah. in a lot of ways, which, which I think is cool. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to mention about the tax stuff is just um, finding the right tax professional, mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, every, every tax individual, um, does their business their own way. And not that it's against any rules to do what we're talking about, cause it's not, but they just may not specialize in it. So finding a tax mm -hmm. professional that yeah. specializes in real estate, um, is a huge benefit. Uh, totally. I mean, it's, it's almost like you can go to a doctor, um, they may give you one diagnosis and you go to a different one and they got a completely different take on it. And it's kind of like sometimes the second one actually just knows more. I mean, it's like, what, you know? And so, and I've, I've witnessed this firsthand. I mean, and this is no knock on any industry, you know, I'm not beating up on CPAs, but there's definitely a contingency of, of, of people that are in the, in, in the, um, in that realm and they just, they don't understand. It's clear that they don't necessarily understand the rules or else a, they would be helping people understand it and they'd be picking more clients, you know? Well, yeah, to your point, like one of, one of the things I always say to folks is find like all realtors and all lenders are not the same. Mm -hmm. Like I own a place in 30A, we Airbnb it, VRBO it ourselves. We've done the process. We, we, we know what the market is down there. We're in that world. Mm -hmm. You have a place down there as well. You know, the market, you, you know, mm -hmm. you can, you can speak experience in that. And so just if, if you're looking to find a short-term rental or a vacation property, the first thing you should ask that agent is, do you have short-term rentals in this area? Do yeah. you have vacation rentals in this area? What experience do you have? Because yes, any agent can sell you a short-term rental or sell you the house or sell you the property, but you also just want to have that conversation and, and you want to have that understanding that, hey, they know what they're doing. They, they can mm -hmm. talk about it. They've experienced it. Um, they've lived it. So I think that's important too with the tax professional, the lender to your point, mm -hmm. and uh, as the agent, just find the right team that is, that has done and accomplished what it is you, that you want to achieve. So, um, before we let you get, we want to talk about like Pigeon Forge Gatlinburg, like talk about that. So people, it's pretty up there. Right, right. now is a great time. To, <laughs> well, it's, it's funny pretty up there. People, I mean, people, they, they you know, Tennessee is very unique state for those, you know, it's very flat in Memphis. And as you go easterly, I mean, middle Tennessee, we have these rolling Hills and then you get into the Smoky Mountains. Yeah. And it's like this magical thing. It's gorgeous. I mean, the Smoky Mountains, Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg um, have been on, especially during COVID, uh, they were ranked the number one mountain destination that people were going to. And that's one reason why that area exploded. Um, Dolly, Dolly, Dolly World is a, uh, Dolly is a fun place. It is a fun place. Uh, which is Lots awesome. Lots of great roller coasters. I was surprised when it, I first went. I was like, wow, I had no idea. And then the other fun thing to do is just drive up and down the main strip and see how many pancake houses and antique stores right. you can you can count. <laughs> but but the interesting thing about about Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg is they are they are beautiful, they are gorgeous. 
Um, the short-term rentals that are doing well are still, are just like regular real estate. They're the ones that look the best and are yeah. in the best position and the best areas. And the cool thing about visiting that area right now is the town itself had so much growth and development because of the big boom, mm -hmm. but with the high interest rates and with inflation and with the dollar value not going as far, some folks that typically vacationed in the Smoky Mountains stopped going. And so the um, attendance, so to speak, uh, dropped a yeah. lot. And so it's kind of a good time to go because it's yeah. pretty like it's it's not that busy right. and you can take advantage of a lot of new shops and new restaurants and new adventures. It brings up a good point. I mean, um, sometimes the, to make the numbers work, people are having to put more down than mm -hmm. they were before. And so perhaps, you know, instead of 20%, maybe they're doing 30, 35%. Um, just to, to make it make sense, knowing that, you know, that the, the outlook there is, is a good one in terms of appreciation over time. And a lot of times what people will do, I think it bears mentioning is if they don't have the ask, if they don't have the down payment saved, what we're seeing is a lot of people is utilize the, a home, tap into their equity. Mm. And so tap into their equity in their primary residence and uh, utilize some of that for a down payment. So that strategy works a lot. So think about that guys, if you're thinking about maybe purchasing a rental property, investment property, second home in the mountains in East Tennessee or on 30A, or maybe you're out there listening from somewhere else and you'd like the second home and sort of dip your toe in the water here in Nashville area. But this has been great, man. Thanks, Thanks for coming yeah, on. Thanks uh, for having me. You're, you're amazing. And I, I'm so glad that um, you've got so much uh, happiness in your life yeah. your, with your boys um, and Jamie and can't wait to hang out again down at the beach, man. That's so, it. all right, brother. Talk to you soon. Thank you, brother. Thanks. Thanks for coming on, guys. And we will see you next time. See ya.